Deepak, we're here in Tucson. Uh, if we go back 20 years when this conference first began, the big debate was not over the fundamental nature of consciousness, but whether consciousness was even real or not. But everybody assumed, basically, that biological naturalism, when I was trained as a neuroscience, that neuroscience will explain everything ultimately. But is consciousness real, or should we just eliminate it to totally? Fast forward 20 years, you now have very radically different position. Some scientists are, are, have become panpsychists, looking for mind in every little piece of matter. Others look to quantum physics to explain uh, consciousness. Some have very radical theories of information where there's phase space going on. How come? I think uh, as people have tried to solve the so-called hard problem um, through neuroscience, they end up being stymied, uh, they get frustrated. Uh, I just looked up the two most open questions in science recently. Number one was, uh, what is the stuff of the universe? What is it made of? And number two uh, was, what's still the biological basis of consciousness? So my response to that is, the stuff of the universe is non-stuff, <laughs> and it is consciousness. And the answer to the second question, what is the biological basis of consciousness, is the wrong question. Biology is an emergent property of consciousness. Therefore, there's only consciousness. The stuff of the universe is consciousness, and um, the awareness of the universe is also consciousness. There are only two experiences we can say, two things we can say categorically, which I think no one can deny. Number one, there is existence. Okay, I agree. Number two, there is awareness of existence. Could they be the same thing? Okay. Let's look at this spectrum. You have the vast majority of scientists, neuroscientists, uh, certainly of which I once was, uh, who believe 100% sure that consciousness is an emergent property of brain one way or the other in some identity theory. Uh, you now have these uh, uh, growing group of people who think that you can never explain consciousness with neural correlates, that things you can see in the brain are, are, will explain really be consciousness. But you go much further than any of them by saying that all the intermediary stuff doesn't matter. There is only consciousness. The universe is consciousness. Uh, experienced perceptually as stars, galaxies, your own body. Okay. How, how, your, how do you say your that? Your thoughts, feelings. What, what is the fundamental reason that you can give me to defend that extreme position? Go beyond the appearance of molecules. You enter a subatomic cloud. Go beyond the cloud, you end up with nothing. The question, and you know, you have Lawrence Krauss and all these people caught saying the universe from nothing, right? So, so far, I have no disagreement. But what is the nature of this nothing? You know, right this moment where we are sitting, we are surrounded by space. In fact, our body is mostly space. And I'm told by reliable quantum physicists, and you can ask them yourself, that every cubic centimeter of space has more mass energy than is needed to make this universe several times over. So what is this little space here can make the universe, the quantum vacuum, or right now, Frank uh, will check at MIT, calls it the grid. Other people have called it the matrix. Yeah. Other people yeah. refer to it as the ether or whatever, yeah. the zero point energy field, the Akashic field, many names. But the fact is, yes, the universe is coming out of nothing. At this moment, it's gushing out of nothing. And it's doing so with mathematical precision. If you're off by a decimal point, then we wouldn't be having this conversation. And we wouldn't, this thing wouldn't exist, nor would this, nor would the brain. Right. So what is the nature of nothing? Rumi, the great Sufi poet says, we come spinning out of nothingness, scattering stars like dust. He says, look at these worlds spinning out of nothingness, this is you. So you see, when I look at the problem of so-called problem of consciousness, I asked myself a different question. I said, who's asking the question? Okay, where are experiments 
designed? Where are observations made? Where are theories conceived? I think you can't get away from the fact that even science is an activity in consciousness. And science deals with observed objects. But those observed objects, when you look at them, they also are made out of nothing. So at the deepest level, the observer and the observed are differentiated aspects of the same nothingness. People use the word nothingness and they mean different things by yes. it. Uh, you nothing do, is the womb you, of creation. You don't need, you, you don't mean absolute nothing. You, your nothing has consciousness. Yes. Uh, physicists nothing has quantum fields. Where do, do they come from? Do these quantum fields have an organizing principle? You know, I wrote to some of the people who talk of nothing. I, you know, I wrote to, to, I won't name them right now, but the, the all, authorities. All, all my the, friends. Okay, all your friends. I said, is the universe coming, gushing out of nothingness this moment? Yes. Is it doing so with mathematical precision? Yes. Do you think there's an organizing principle that's doing that? No response. Suddenly the email starts <laughs> not being well, responded that's, that's to. A very, that's a very good point. But I would contend that your consciousness is no different in its fundamental nature than the physicist's quantum fields. That They are both a presupposition that exists to get out of a real nothing. A real nothing has nothing. You want to say nothing, it's really nothing. You make consciousness. Physicists put quantum fields. When they say nothing, they mean not observable, because it is the observer, but they don't go there, okay? When, when the whole measurement problem deals with, you know, that a particle doesn't have a position or uh, a velocity or momentum till measured. What is it till measured? It's a probability or a possibility. Right, right. Where does that exist? Okay. So, you know, of course, you can compute these probabilities through Schrodinger's wave function or, you know, Feynman's refinement of that or uh, Paul Dirac's equation and all of that. But then you say, where is this computation taking place? Or why oh, did it come? Why is it there at all? Yeah. How, did, how did it get there? How, but where is it? They say Hilbert space. You say, is, what is Hilbert space? It's a multi-dimensional infinite space. Where is it? It's mathematical. So where is that mathematical space? You know, I don't think you can, you know, as what says I, Heisenberg was it? Or Max Planck? Max Planck said, you can't get behind consciousness. You cannot get behind consciousness. Okay, now we are sitting in this beautiful museum. Look at these paintings behind us, they were conceived in consciousness. Okay, somebody imagined that, and then here you have the visible expression of that. Where is imagination? Where is intention? Where is insight? Where is intuition? Where is creativity? Where is time? I mean, these are very fundamental questions, and you can't get behind the fact that they're all experienced. These are experiences in consciousness. We have no theory today that tells us how we experience anything. You know, when looking at those paintings, all that's coming to my eyes is photons. They're colorless. They're <laughs> dimensionless. Okay? What's going to my brain is an electrical current. I don't see photons. I see a three-dimensional world in space and time. Where is that constructed? Certainly not in my brain, because if you looked inside my brain, all you'd see is electrochemicals. How did those electrochemicals learn to imagine or create this painting or write a symphony, you know, write the music for a symphony? 